I have a dream that one day, no matter how long it may take us, as long as we have faith in our cause and uh, an unconquerable willpower, knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. This is a time of challenge to our interests and our values. And it's a time to test our wisdom and our skills. This will not be a campaign of half measures. And we will accept no outcome but victory. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. Well, good morning. Uh, as you've heard already this morning, uh, we're talking about politics. Uh, you may or may not know this, but we have an election coming up here. Uh, now we're uh, under two months, right? And uh, I, here's what I, I want to tell you this morning. Um, at, we're in this series called Oh Say, Can't You See? And we're talking about politics. But what you need to know is that no matter who wins in November, God is still in control. And Jesus is still on his throne, and the Holy Spirit is still the greatest power on the face of the earth. And, and so that's the direction that, that we're coming from in this series. And uh, what, what I want to start with this morning is to tell you that, uh, oh, say can't you see America's a mess? You know that, right? Oh, say can't you see that the solution to America's mess is not a political fix, it's a spiritual fix. Uh, this week, Thursday evening, um, I was at the Municipal Coliseum and uh, at, at Park Ridge Center's uh, annual banquet. I had the privilege to be there. And uh, by the way, uh, when you give to Aldersgate, when you place your tithes and offerings in these boxes, either here or across the street, or you give online, or you have it deducted out of your account or whatever, every time you give, part of what you give goes to Park Ridge Center. Uh, a place for women facing unexpected pregnancy to go and find truth and hope. And so uh, that's, that's one of the things that we love to support. And we were there this week, Amy and I were, and Dr. Tony Evans was the speaker. And uh, in part of his message, one of the things he said, he kind of skipped over it, but I hung on to it for a while. And here's what he said. He said, God does not skip the church house to fix the White House. Oftentimes, we just think if we elect the right person or if we have a Christian or that everything is going to be fixed. But when the reality is that the fix is not political, the fix is spiritual. And the spiritual fix does not begin in the White House. The spiritual fix begins in the church. And, and, and what we need is an awakening, a spiritual awakening. What we need is revival. You, you guys know the word revival. Some of you, you know revival well. And some of you, you're just kind of vaguely familiar with the word revival. What does the word revival mean to you? Some of you have images immediately of these big tents, right, that were set up. And some guy that was really loud would come and preach on a megaphone for it seemed like months on end, right? And everybody would gather in these tents for me, uh, I have this visual. I grew up in a, smoth, a Southern Baptist church. Every spring and fall, we had a revival. Whether we needed it or not, it came. And, and what I remember is that not only did we go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, but we also went to church on Monday night and Tuesday night and Thursday night and Friday night. I remember that when I was real little. The older I got, I guess we got better. We only went through Wednesday or Thursday. But I remember going to church every evening, and uh, I remember it was a time when we were supposed to invite the entire community. I grew up in a small community, and so not only did the Southern Baptist people came, but the Methodist came. And I really think they just came for the pre-service meal, <laughs> the potluck that happened before the revival, Right? And then during the service, they would begin to feel this rumbling in their body, and they didn't know if it was the Holy Spirit or the English peace salad that they ate as part of the potluck dinner. 
One thing I do remember about revivals, though, is that it was okay to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, because the preaching was always better than what we were used to. And the music was always better than what we were used to. Maybe it wasn't better, it was just different. But I want to share with you uh, that where we're going, this book of Jonah... That's where we're at for four weeks. If you haven't opened it and started reading it, I would encourage you to do that. In the book of Jonah, revival looks a lot different than a big tent or a week-long church service. In fact, in the book of Jonah, there's this city called Nineveh, which maybe has the greatest revival ever recorded in history. Now, I could stand up here and tell you the whole story, but I think maybe Big Idea Productions can do it a little bit better than I can. So let's let Big Idea show us a little bit about Jonah. Every night before he went to sleep, Jonah would pray and ask God if there was a new message for him to deliver. And this night, there was a message that would change Jonah's life. A new message? Yes. What's that? People being unkind, lying, stealing. Oh, dear. Sounds like a standard turn and repent to me. All right, name the town. I'll be on my way first thing in the morning. Uh, Where is it? Jericho? Uh, Damascus? What? Nineveh? I'm not aware of any Ninevehs in Israel. Uh, No, I don't think... uh... Oh, you mean that Nineveh? That Nineveh wasn't in Israel at all. It was the capital of Assyria, and it was the biggest, meanest city around. Now the people of Nineveh were particularly mean to Jonah's people, the Israelites. They lied, they stole, but worst of all, they slapped people with fishes. They even slapped each other with fishes. They didn't know the difference between right and wrong. The Ninevites were so mean, in fact, that most Israelites, including Jonah, wished God would just wipe Nineveh off the face of the earth. So you understand Jonah now, right? Jonah was a prophet. God called Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and speak to them, basically not saying that they needed a political fix, but they needed a spiritual fix. They needed an awakening. They needed a revival. And as I've said, perhaps Nineveh will go down as the greatest revival in all of history. Let me tell you a little bit more about Nineveh. So Nineveh was this great city. In fact, it was one of the greatest cities of all time. Nineveh at the time of Jonah was probably about a million people. Now let me put that in perspective for you, okay? Lubbock has about 240,000 people, so about a fourth the size of Nineveh. Uh, Modern day Austin or San Francisco would be more comparable to the population of Nineveh. I think both Austin and San Francisco have about 900,000 people. And so this was the size of Nineveh. The streets of Nineveh were 20 miles long. So this afternoon when the 1111 service is over, I'm hitting the road to head to Abernathy to some meetings that we're beginning there with the Methodist Church in terms of a collaboration that we're working on with them. More on that later. But I will drive about 20 miles from here to Abernathy. So I want you to understand the perspective. This was the size of the city of Nineveh. Uh, Scholars tell us that if one was to walk around the perimeter of Nineveh, it would have taken them three days to do so. And these are people that were used to walking. They walked everywhere they went. The walls that surrounded Nineveh, I'm not sure who paid for them, but they had walls that surrounded, it was a political joke, a bad one, but it was a political joke. They had walls that surrounded Nineveh. The walls that surrounded Nineveh were 100 feet high, 10 stories high. So I want you to imagine this in your mind down by Jones Stadium, the Overton Hotel. That's how tall these walls were. All the way around the 20 miles of Nineveh. And the walls were wide enough that three chariots, economy cars, could drive across the wall of Nineveh at the same time. 
you need to understand the imagery that we're talking about here. And you need to understand that not only was Nineveh large in population and in size, but Nineveh lived life largely. Nineveh had the greatest food and drink. Nineveh had the greatest entertainment. I mean, if you were happening, it was in Nineveh. That was the happening place. That's where everything, I mean, that's, if you were a partier, you went to Nineveh. If you wanted entertainment, you went to Nineveh. If you wanted good food and good drink, you went to Nineveh. They had excess everywhere. Is this sounding familiar to you? The other thing you need to know about Nineveh is that they were a messy people. They were a, as the Bible says, wicked people people evil people they did much more than just slap each other with fish the Ninevites were cruel they would take adults and begin to rip their skin off for no reason and leave them sitting out in the sun to scorch to death they were famous for burning children alive the, the, the wickedness that happened in Nineveh, it all literally boiled down to the fact that they did not value human life. Is this sounding familiar? Almost every issue that's part of the mess in America can be boiled down to the one thing, we do not value human life. I don't care what issue it is. You can pick any issue that's part of this presidential campaign. You can pick immigration. You can pick health care. You can pick any issue that you want. And you can almost every time boil it down to one single root. And that is we value human life differently. This is where Nineveh was. In fact, let me just give you the description of Nineveh in Jonah. By the way, I'm not going to put any scripture up on the screen this morning. If you've got a Bible, I would encourage you to open it up to Jonah. If you've got your phone, I'm encouraging you during these next three weeks to read through the four chapters of Jonah, to study the book of Jonah. But in Jonah chapter 2, we understand that Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, that great city, and here's what he says, and call out against it for their evil has come up before me. Nineveh literally stunk to high heaven. I mean, we get this description of their wickedness, of their evilness. In fact, there's another prophet that describes Nineveh. I'm going to turn over there. It's just a few pages from Jonah. This prophet, his name was Nahum. If you want to flip over there in your Bible or on your phone, or if you want to just jot it down and study this week. But in Nahum, chapter 3, he begins to describe Nineveh. And here's what he says. He says, Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey. To the crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, host of slain heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. Watch verse 5. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts, <laughs> and I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness. Now, couldn't have Big Idea Productions done something with that? Do you see what God is saying? That he was going to destroy them. They were so wicked, so evil, so self-absorbed that he was literally going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And in fact, all of God's people wanted them wiped off the face of the earth. God did not reach out to the president of Nineveh. God reached out to a man named Jonah. And so, Jonah, I want you to go and give a message to Nineveh. Bring about an awakening. Bring about a revival in the city of Nineveh. And so Jonah ran the other way. 
Nineveh had a reputation. Jonah didn't want to go there. So he ran the other way. He finds himself on a ship. And I'm going to pick up there today in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, but the Lord hurled, this is after Jonah gets on the ship headed the opposite direction. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, you sleeper? Let me re-paraphrase that. How in the world are you sleeping? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. How in the world could Jonah have fallen asleep in the middle of this huge storm with this rope balking, rocking all over the place? Have you ever been on a boat in the middle of a storm? Some of you. Maybe you've been deep sea fishing. You come up in the middle of a storm. Maybe you've just been out fishing. Maybe, you, you, maybe you've been on a cru- cruise and you've come up on a storm. That happened to me one time. I was on a cruise and uh, we were out at sea and all of a sudden we ran into this storm. And even on this big ship, I mean, it started swaying and rocking. Here's what you need to know about me. I don't like water. Right? I drink it. That's about it. Uh, if I can't see the bottom, I don't want to be in it. If I can't see land, I don't want to be in it. And here I am out on this ship, and this storm, you can't hardly see because of the storm, and then the ship begins to rock and sway. Everywhere we went, there were people who were laying, vomit was everywhere, it was awful. And uh, like I said, I was young, it was time for dinner, so what did we do? We went to dinner. Uh, And the waiter that had been waiting on us all week when we sat down for dinner, I mean, it was so bad. Like, literally, you had to sit with your hands on the table, and it was okay, because if you didn't, things would fly off everywhere. And so we were sitting there, and the waiter came up, and he said, listen, I've worked on this ship for a very long time. I've gotten used to it. But before I got used to it, I got some really, really good advice. And what I was told is that when you are in a storm and the ship is rocking back and forth, then you sway with the ship. So as you're sitting here eating tonight, you, you sway with the ship. And so here we are, this big group around this table. We're holding our plates and glasses down, and we're swaying with the ship. And if you've ever been on one of these cruises, you know that you don't just eat, right? Like, you eat. And so every meal is like this five-course meal. And so we're sitting here. We're eating this five-course meal. We're rocking back and forth. But the fifth course, like dessert... The waiter comes and brings it to us, and he says to us, Hey, guys, by the way, we went through the storm a long time ago. You can stop swaying now. (laughs) But I I can't imagine in that experience going to sleep. It was awful. It was terrible. And here Jonah is. He's asleep on the ship. Let me ask it to you this way. Have you ever accidentally fallen asleep? This morning doesn't count. Have you ever accidentally fallen asleep when you didn't mean to? Like, have you ever sat down in your favorite chair or on the couch, you wanted to watch a TV show, and the next thing you know, you wake up, and your glasses are all shifted off the side of your face, and you have to peel your face away from the chair or the sofa because where you drooled is now stuck to your cheek and the chair. Have you been there? Like, you didn't mean to fall asleep, but you just fell asleep. Sometimes that happens to me. I go home on Sunday afternoons. I sit down. I turn on the TV and begin to watch the Dallas Cowboys. They're losing. I fall asleep unintentionally. I wake up. They're still losing. You ever done that, right? You just fall asleep unintentionally? Uh, When I was growing up, I remember this. I'll never forget this. Uh, It was in high school. It was in a history class. Coach Johnson We were sitting there in history class, and one of the students, one of our friends, fell asleep in class. Listen, I mean full out on his desk, like this, asleep. And I remember Coach Johnson all of a sudden stopped his lecture and said, Shh, everybody get up real quietly and tiptoe out into the hallway. So we did, listen, this was the greatest lesson I learned in this class all year long. (laughs) We got up, 
we tiptoed out into the hallway. He shut the door. The door had a window on it so we could all peek in to our friend who was still in the classroom asleep on his desk. And we waited until he woke up. You ever been in that situation? He woke up, raised up, began to look around. Like, I think he thought the rapture had happened and he was left behind. (laughs) Can you unexpectedly fall asleep spiritually? You don't mean to. You didn't intend to. But you fell asleep. That's what happened to Nineveh. That's why God doesn't skip the church house to fix the White House. Because he's got to wake the church up first. Have you ever been awakened from a dead sleep? Like it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you are sound asleep and your phone rings. Right? And you pick it up and the first thing on the other end is, uh, are you asleep? (laughs) No, right? But when someone says, are you asleep? No, 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 I wasn't asleep. Really? It's three o'clock in the morning. Yes, you were asleep. But you denied it. Is it possible to do that spiritually? To be asleep and deny the fact that we're asleep. The message of Jonah is not that he was just physically asleep on the ship, but that he was spiritually asleep. And that Nineveh was spiritually asleep. And God was about to do one of the greatest awakenings of all time. God was about to bring one of the greatest revivals of all time. If you read through the rest of Nineveh, you get to the end of the story where Jonah goes to Nineveh. He delivers the message. And guess what? They listened. They repented. They woke up. There was this huge, incredible revival. And here's what I believe. I believe if God can do it for Nineveh, he can do it for America. I believe if God did it then, he can do it now. But here's what I know. It doesn't begin out there. It doesn't begin over there. It begins right here. You see, here's what I know about revival. It's more than big tents. It's more than a week-long church service. You see, revival is not for those who don't yet believe in Christ. They don't need revival. They need salvation. Revival is is for those who believe in Christ but have fallen asleep. The solution to America's problem is not a political revival, it's a spiritual revival. And that revival begins right here. And listen, it's not something we can create or organize. It's not something we can say, okay, starting on this Sunday and going through this Friday, we're going to have a revival. That's not how it works. God decides the time and the place. But here's what I do know. God answers prayer. And perhaps God is yearning for his people to pray for revival. Not that this person would be elected or this person would be elected. Not that that person would be a Christian. Not that they would institute biblical principles and the laws that they try to initiate in the United States of America. But that the church that you and that I would realize that while the world is in a storm, we've fallen asleep. And it begins in your heart and in my heart. And so this morning, we're going to end this way. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm not going to ask you to pray for revival in America. I'm going to ask you to pray for revival in your own heart. I'm going to ask you to spend some time Face to face with God, just asking the question, where have I fallen asleep? Maybe I didn't intend to. Where have I been denying that I have fallen asleep? Where does God want to wake me up and start revival in me? Let's pray.